other night, um, I had to go into Daytona. Um, my daughter went and uh, had a, a, a night of, of just relaxation at a hotel, and I had to go there, and they had, the receptionist had this glass plate, or I guess plexiglass, surrounding the whole foyer, I guess, that separates the clerk from the individual. And uh, I, I was listening half and on and uh, on and off, and she was talking to my daughter as she was getting in the hotel room, and, and I'm trying my hardest to hear what she was saying. And, and I could not, I, I mean, I could not hear, I know I'm getting old, and I, 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 I'm trying to read her lips and struggling just to make out what she says. And sometimes I would make it out and sometimes I wouldn't. And then I got to the point, says, you know, this is useless. Absolutely useless. I'm not even going to try. So I just stood here and I'm watching. And, it's just, and I, I justify to myself for not listening because it doesn't apply to me. I'm not getting the room. I don't need to know what she says. My daughter needs to know what she says, but I don't. This morning, I ask that we make a commitment to say, Lord, this does apply to me. I do need to hear what you say. I want to know what you say. And I ask that everybody would make a commitment with me this morning and say, I will make that commitment. Lord, I want to know what you have for me this morning. All right. Father, we ask this morning your blessing on this lesson. We ask that you will work through me to bring the burden of your heart, that you will give us an understanding of who you are, of your great love with what you love us with, of how we should be showing the same love, the same mercy, the same grace, the same patience with others. Father, we ask that you will make a difference in our life and we can make a difference in others to bring them to a saving knowledge of you not just as Savior, but as Lord. We ask that you'll help us to make you Lord in our lives daily. We commit these things to you in your Son's holy name. We ask it and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. This morning's topic seems to have a lot of people questioning not just the fairness and the goodness of God, but also the existence of of God. The topic is the mercy of God. And let's begin with defining what mercy is. Mercy is withholding that punishment that is rightfully deserved. And let me give you an example. You are driving in your vehicle down State Road 40. There are two things on your mind. Will you make it to your appointment on time? And can this car in front of you go any slower? <laughs> you come to a spot on 40 where you're able to pass. You do so safely and continue on as if nothing had ever happened. Then you notice the car that you passed starts flashing these blue lights at you. Your heart skips a beat when you realize that you just passed an unmarked car. <laughs> you pull over, and the officer just waits in his car. A few minutes, you're beginning to sweat. What have I done? He comes out and asks you for your driver's license, your registration, your insurance card. He looks at the information and asks, do you know why I pulled you over? And you trying to be charming, you say, for my dashingly good looks. <laughs> he smiles and says, no, you are going 85 in a 55 mile hour zone. I have every right to give you a ticket. And you required to take a driver's safety class, but I'm not. You have been caught dead to rights. And he only gives you a warning. He has shown you mercy. Mercy was withholding the punishment that you rightly deserved. 
many people have heard that God's mercy endures forever. And it lasts from everlasting to everlasting. But they come to areas in Scripture where they ask, is that really true? Can I believe what the Word of God says? When it comes to my faith in God, can I really believe that He is, He will, and is showing mercy to me? I would like for us to start in Psalms 136. Psalms 136. We're not going to read the whole chapter, but I would like for you to see that the Bible repeatedly states that His mercy does endure forever. All 26 verses in this chapter of Psalms 136 end with the same six words. For His mercy endureth forever. Verse 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. Skip down to verse 13. To him which divided the Red Sea into parts, for his mercy endureth forever. Verse 16. To him which led his people through the wilderness, for his mercy endureth forever. To him which smote great kings, for his mercy endureth forever. Who slew famous kings, for his mercy endureth forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites, for his mercy endureth forever. And Og, the king of Bashan, for his mercy endureth forever. And it goes all the way down. And you can study this later. But we see the same six words. His mercy endureth forever. If you would flip over to Psalms 100. Verse 5, for the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. If this is true, which I believe that it is, how come we see areas in Scripture where it looks as though God did not show His mercy? For example, let's turn to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. beginning with verse 11. The earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come, upon, is come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The ark, the length of the ark, shall be 300 cubits. The breadth of it, 50 cubits. The height of it, 30 cubits. A window shalt thou make in the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. And the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof. With lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the bread of life, breath of life from under heaven. And everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant. And thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. What we see here is God's wrath about to be poured on the inhabitants of the earth. Now flip over to chapter 7. Let's look at this. We're dealing with mercy. It doesn't sound like God's very merciful. 
chapter 7, and start verse 1, and the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. And skip down to verse 13. In that selfsame day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife, and the three wives of the sons of his sons with them into the ark. They and every beast after his kind and all the cattle after their kind and every keep creeping, creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind and every fowl after his kind, every bird of every sort. And they went in unto Noah into the ark two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they that were, went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God hath commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. When God shut the door of the ark, he closed the door on mercy for all those outside the ark. But didn't we just read in Psalms that his mercy endureth forever and was everlasting? Well, Steve, common sense says, well, that's simple. They were sinners. They were corrupt, violent. Imagination in their heart was continually evil. They don't deserve mercy. Listen, none of us deserve mercy. You ever had a wicked thought? Have you ever gotten angry without a cause? Have you ever been corrupt? Are you possibly sinning now? We have read many times the wages of sin is death. How much mercy will God show me? Will God close the door on mercy to me? If you would turn to Romans chapter 9. Will God close the door on mercy to me? Romans chapter 9. We'll begin reading in verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Moses, even for the same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore he hath mercy on whom he will have mercy, and on whom he will hardeneth. Paul is answering a question apparently other people had and states very clearly that no amount of wishing is going to get you the mercy of God. No amount of works is going to win you the mercy of God. It is the character and sovereignty of God to do what is right and good. Knowing that God is righteous and good, knowing that he will have mercy on whom he chooses, is there any area in the Bible that will help us see if God has closed the door on mercy to me? Is there any key that unlocks that door to God's mercy? There are two foundational scriptures that I would like for us to look at that should give us an assurance of His mercy. If you would turn to Psalms 103. Psalms 103, verse 17. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear the Lord and His righteousness unto the children's children to such as keep his commandments 
and to those that remember His commandments to do them. Now, according to this verse, the Lord's mercy is going to be shown to them that fear God and His righteousness, and those that keep His commandments, and those that don't forget to do His commandments. Does the fear of the Lord and His righteousness change the way you live? They should. If you truly have the fear of the Lord and His righteousness, you will. Let me give you an example. I want you to take a look at a leader by the name of Jehoshaphat who put God first in his life. He made changes in the government that reflected his faith in God and his fear of God. When he started to take the things of God seriously in his life, the people started to notice. Pagan nations started to see what was going on. And the Bible says that they no longer made wars with Jehoshaphat. If you would turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 17. 2 Chronicles chapter 17. Beginning in verse 3. And the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the first ways of his father David and sought not unto Balaam, but sought to the Lord God of his father and walked in his commandments and not after the doings of Israel. Therefore the Lord established the kingdom in his hand and all Judah brought to Jehoshaphat presents and he had riches and honor in abundance. And his heart was lifted up in the ways of the Lord. Moreover, he took away the high places and the groves of Judah. He took down the idol worship. Skip down to verse 9. And they taught in Judah and had the book of the law of the Lord with them and went about throughout all the cities of Judah and taught the people. He reformed the education system. And the fear of the Lord fell upon the kingdoms of the land that were round about Judah so that they made no war against Jehoshaphat. Did you get that? The surrounding lands no longer made war. Why? Because of the fear of the Lord. Look at in verse 11. And some of the Philistines brought Jehoshaphat presents and tribute of silver and the Arabians brought him flocks, 7,000 and 700 rams, 7,000 and 700 he goats. Listen, the fear changes behavior. I remember as a, a, a little child watching these old war movies, John Wayne and all these others, and they're all black and white. And I remember these soldiers with their hard hats on, and they were walking through these fields, and all of a sudden they saw one huge massive explosion happen. Someone had stepped on a landmine. All of a sudden, those soldiers got serious about where they were walking. They started saying, okay, wait a second. He got all that way, and he didn't get killed. What was his, where was his footsteps? What was the right way to go? You know, I think if a lot of people, a lot of Christians started to say, where am I walking? And they recognized sin as a landmine that's going to just devastate them or devastate the family. I believe a lot of people would start watching where they're walking. They'd be concerned about it. Fear changes the way a person behaves. The Bible says that these pagan nations not only didn't make war but with Jehoshaphat, but they brought gifts. Why? Because the fear of the Lord fell on them. Jehoshaphat had to make some hard decisions in life. He made decisions that financially cost him to obey the commandments of God. He had to make decisions that went against popular opinion because they were against the laws of God. You and I need to do the same. It needs to begin with ourselves and our homes. What stops us? What stops you from doing that? Back to the second foundation verse. To opening the door of God's mercy. 
In Psalms 103, we saw the requirement of the fear of the Lord of God and His righteousness, the keeping of His commandments, and not forgetting to do His commandments. Now we're going to see a relation of those things all point to not just an acquaintance with God, but a personal relationship. If you would turn to Psalms 86. Psalms 86. Verse 5, for thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. No, Steve, that's not much different from the other one. Wait a second. The Hebrew shows this word call, the idea of calling someone specific by name. For example, a man was called into court to stand before a judge. Let's just say the name of the judge was John Sinclair. This criminal stands before the judge and says, John, I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything I was accused of. The judge stops him before he even goes any further. Says, excuse me? Who did you call me? I don't know you. You will address me as judge or your honor. Was that judge's name, John? Absolutely. But he didn't have any sort of relationship to him. Same judge. But this time the judge's wife stands before him and addresses him the same way. John, I did everything I'm accused of. That judge stops her and says, Betty, I know that you are my wife and you have every right to call me John, but you stand before me accused you will address me as judge and honor. Both defendants addressed him the same way, but one had a relationship and the other didn't. If you would turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7 and look at some people who called him by Lord, but had no relationship. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work in iniquity. Is it possible that this morning you know who God is, you know His name, you know His righteousness, you know the doctrine of theology, but that's as far as it goes. Think about this for a moment. From the scriptures we read, they knew who the Lord was. They knew He was coming again and told others about it. They were even aware that the devil who the devil was and knew where he belonged. They even did what could be called miracles. Those wonderful works would be miracles today. But Jesus says he never knew them. In verse 21, it divides two kinds of people, the talkers and the doers. Ones who received mercy and ones who didn't. Are you a doer of the word? If you are, you can count on the mercy of God. If you're a talker, the Bible says you are deceiving your own self and your religion is empty. In James 1 chapter, James chapter 1 verse 22. James 1 verse 22 says this. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man, or if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened unto a man beholding his natural face in glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, 
and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. There may be some here to say today say, Steve, I heard every scripture that you read, and I can see where mercy is extended to those who have a relationship with the Lord. I can even count on the mercy being shown to me on the day that I stand before him. But what about right now? Will God withhold punishment for things that I have been rebellious? Before we look at the scripture, there is a difference between punishment and chastisement. Punishment is given by a judge. Chastisement is given by a father. To punish someone is to cause them suffer for a crime or a wrongdoing. To chasten is very similar, but the intent is to bring improvement or a change in the person for their good. If you would turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Will I get chastised? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5 says, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. And look at this, verse 6, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons? Furthermore, you have heard, you have had fathers of your, our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence, Shall we not much rather give, be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. You notice verse 6? Who is he going to chasten? His children. This morning, if you have seen a need for God's mercy and don't have it, the Bible says you can turn to him today. Repent and ask for forgiveness of your sins today. 1 John 1, 12 says, For as many as ye received him, to him gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. This morning, are you a child of God? Yes. Have you received that mercy? Can you count on the mercy? Do you have you established? Have you gotten that adoption of Christ this morning? If there was a question of mercy in your life, or is it a question of chastisement? If anything this morning, you should see that the, His mercy does endure forever. We're going to have an invitation here. If the Lord has shown you some things that you need to establish, like your need for Him in your life, the need for, to be a child of God, you can, make, you can have that happen today. If there's other areas where he says, I, I'm under chastisement. I don't know why I, this is happening, but it's, it's chastisement. Well, we just read that he's doing it not for his good, but for yours. Don't reject it. Don't curse God and say, God, oh, 
I hate what you're doing to me. And you'd say, Lord, this is helping me. I know who you are. The Holy Spirit speaking to you this morning. Do what he's asked. For your mercy. We thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for our sins. What a, a great display of your love for us. Father, we ask that you will help us this week to be the children that you want us to be. If there's chastisement in our lives that is needed, we know that the only reason that happens is because you love us. Father, we ask those that don't know your mercy, we ask that you just stir their minds and their thoughts to recognize what a great and loving God that you are, but your mercy the door could be shut on them. Father, we ask that you would be with us throughout this week. Open the door for us to share the gospel and help us to walk through that door. Be with those who made decisions. Work in their lives. Let them shine for you. In your son's holy name we ask it. In Jesus' name, amen.